everybody. Um, thanks for being here. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Oregon's birthday. <laughs> Who knows how old Oregon is today? 160. Good. Yep, 160. So um, when I retired in 2011, I, like many of you, I started looking for stuff to do, um, new stuff to do. And um, I did start writing, as Bill said, for the Oregon Encyclopedia. How many of you know about the Oregon Encyclopedia? Raise your hand. How many of you have been to the Oregon Encyclopedia? Oh, no. OK. Well, you have an assignment. It's OregonEncyclopedia.org. It's really terrific. It was started 10 years. We're celebrating our 10-year anniversary this year. And it was a, a, a cooperative project, mostly led by historians, academic historians around the state. And we partnered with Portland State University and the Oregon Historical Society. And the project lives now at the Oregon Historical Society. We're up to something like 1,600 articles in the Oregon Encyclopedia about people, places, things, biota. Do you know what biota is? Look it up. Um, <laughs> in Oregon. And it's just a terrific res uh, resource. Um, it's much better than Wikipedia, I promise. <laughs> so use the, use the Oregon Encyclopedia. So I've written about a dozen articles for the Oregon Encyclopedia. And one of them was about the making of the general. And, that, and I did tons of research and, uh, and wrote an article, which you can go read after this at OregonEncyclopedia.org. So let me tell you the story of the making of the general. The year was 1925, and Buster Keaton was at the, at the very peak of his fame and fortune. He began his film career in 1917 in Hollywood at the tender age of 22. He'd been a child actor in vaudeville with his, his, he and his parents actually had a vaudeville act. And he began uh, to make shorts with Fatty Arbuckle, which most of you will remember Fatty Arbuckle. That's how he started his film career. But, but in only a few years, uh, by 1920, he had his own studio and he made his first full-length feature film. So in 1925, he had just completed his seventh feature film, and he was looking for a new subject. And a friend recommended that he make a film about what was known as the Andrews Raid in the Civil War. It happened in 1862. And um, in the Andrews Raid, Union spies from Tennessee came down to Georgia and hijacked a train and took it back up to Tennessee and they tore up the tracks and they cut down telephone lines and that was the Andrews raid. So um, his friend said, you know, you really ought to make a movie about this and there was a book that he apparently read that told about it. So he decided to do just that. Now this film I should say, is very loosely based on the actual Andrews Raid. What it really is is a love story. So it's very apropos for Valentine's Day. It's a Civil War love story. Um, so um, in the film, Buster Keaton plays a Southerner named Johnny Gray. Get it? This isn't subtle. And he is the engineer of a train, a locomotive called the General. That's where the movie gets its name. It's the name of the locomotive. And he has a sweetheart, of course, and her name is Annabelle Lee. <laughs> and she's played by a young actress named Marion Mack, who I just think is terrific. Most of you probably never heard of her. She only did a few films. This is, was her most famous film by far. She had a very brief career in the silent films back then. But I, I think in, in some ways she almost steals the show. She's so good in this movie. I love her. Anyway, they attempted to shoot this film where the Andrews Raid actually occurred in northern Georgia and Tennessee. And they wanted to use the actual steam locomotive, the General, which they actually found in, in uh, 1925. Um, 
So they went to, it was, a, it was on display in Chattanooga, Tennessee, the general, the, the locomotive. So they went to Chattanooga, not Buster, his location guys, went to Chattanooga and they, they talked him up and they said, we'd really like to make this film here, we'd like to use this train, what do you think? And they thought about it and they realized it was Buster Keaton and this was going to be a comedy about the Civil War. And in 1925, people in Chattanooga, Tennessee, were not ready for a comedy about the Civil War. There were still, and, and so um, there were still veterans at that time, as you can imagine. So they thought about it, but they said, no, uh-uh, we're, we're, we're going to turn down that deal. So the location guys had to, had to go back to square one, and as luck would have it, they found that in Cottage Grove, Oregon, there was a locomotive that was almost exactly the same as the, as the general, working in the um, timber industry, hauling logs from the forest to the mill in, uh, in Cottage Grove. And so um, they decided, they went to Cottage Grove and they said, would you like to be the location for this movie? And they said, you bet. We would love to be the location for this movie. At that time, uh, Cottage Grove had about 2,000 inhabitants, and they had the perfect setup, really, for this film because it took more than one set of tracks because you've, you've got to film the trains going down the tracks. So in Cottage Grove, they had like two sets of tracks so they could put the camera on this set of tracks and film what's happening on this set of tracks. So it was going to be perfect. So on May 27, 1926, 18 freight cars full of equipment, props, and costumes arrived in Cottage Grove, Oregon. And they built an elaborate set, which you'll see in the very opening scene here. It's amazing what they built uh, for this movie to resemble downtown Marietta, Georgia, which is where the, the film begins. And... Um, that was built at the east end of town. If you know Cottage Grove, it's kind of where I-5 goes through now, kind of between that and the downtown is where they built, built that set. It's not there anymore, of course. So Buster Keaton's film company, which numbered about 60 people, took over the Bartell Hotel in downtown Cottage Grove. It's still there. In fact, there's a restaurant there called Buster's Main Street Cafe, which I highly recommend. The food there is very good. So they took over the whole hotel. He brought his wife. That's how they did it back then. His, he, his wife was Natalie Talmadge. And that may ring a bell with some of you. The famous Talmadge sisters were film stars back then. And Natalie was one of the sisters. And she was Buster Keaton's wife. And he brought his two sons. And they all, they all had, a, had rooms in the hotel. He also brought his father, Joe, who, of course, he used to perform in vaudeville with. And he gave him a part in the movie. And you'll see Joe, towards the end of the movie, there's scenes that happen up in Tennessee where uh, Buster Keaton's trying to rescue his girl. And they're in a house. And there's three Confederate generals. And Joe is one of the Confederate generals. You can tell who Joe is. He's the one without facial hair. So look for Joe, Joe Keaton. So the film began uh, filming on June the 8th, and they really took over the whole town. It's estimated that about three-quarters of the locals in Cottage Grove work in some way on this film, either as extras or, or as help or, you know, just doing odd jobs. And um, the filming took place six days a week, beginning at 6 in the morning. They, they worked hard. On Sundays, they would take the day off, and Buster Keaton was a huge baseball fan. In fact, he was really a terrific shortstop, and some people say he could have played um, professional baseball. He was so good. So he would organize a game every Sunday, um, a baseball game, and that's what they did and involved some of the people from the town. Keaton hired the Oregon National Guard to supply the soldiers that you'll see in the movie. And they, they didn't have enough soldiers, so they play both the Union soldiers and the Confederate soldiers. 
So you'll, there's, a, there's a scene tor towards the end of the movie where, where Keaton's going down the track in the general and he sees the Confederate soldiers retreating. He looks and sees Confederate soldiers retreating and then pretty soon he sees Union soldiers advancing and it's really the same guys. They just, <laughs> they just change their uniforms. <clears throat> And much of the general was shot east of Cottage Grove on the rail lines belonging to the Oregon Pacific and Eastern Railroad. There's chase scenes. In fact, this movie is in many ways kind of a big long chase scene as you'll see. And they were filmed as I mentioned earlier on a camera that was mounted on another track and had to go along and film what was going on. Now the most spectacular scene in the film, which is the climax of the movie, was shot on July 23rd, 1926. It required the construction of a 215 foot trestle bridge across the Rau River, which is east of Cottage Grove. It actually runs through the town too, I think. Near the tiny community of Culp Creek, which is about 25 miles east of um, Cottage Grove. And in the film, Johnny Gray sets this trestle bridge that they built, especially for the movie, on fire after he crosses it in the general. And the pursuing train with the Union soldiers that are chasing him is called the Texas. And it crashes into the river in a fiery, spectacular collapse. Some of you may have seen this. If you haven't seen the movie, you may have just seen the clip of this because it's all over the place. It's, it's a really a famous scene. And this was a holiday for everybody in Cottage Grove because they knew this was going to happen. This was going to be filmed and they all went out to watch it because it really was something to see. So they were all sitting around watching this happen. It, w it obviously had to be done in one take. <laughs> um, and the, the scene cost an ex, uh, over a half million dollars, this one scene, in, in 2019 money. Back then it was, it was $42,000, but that, that's equivalent to about a half million dollars in today's money. And it's said to be the most expensive scene ever filmed in silent film history. And the train, interestingly, that fell, off, fell down into the river, it stayed in the river and it became a tourist attraction. People would go out to see the train that was in the general and it stayed in the river. They, they didn't care that much about environmental issues probably with the steam locomotive in the river back then, but it stayed in the river until World War II when they needed scrap metal and they pulled it out and, and they salvaged it for World War II. So the filming continued until August the 6th. And that's when forest fires in the area, we know about that. We know about August in Oregon, we get forest fires. And it was so smoky that they, they couldn't continue the filming. But it was okay because they had some filming to do uh, uh, back in Hollywood. So basically they packed up and they went back to Hollywood and they filmed some scenes that you'll see towards the end of the movie. There's some interior scenes with the three generals that I was talking about. There's scenes in the forest um, where they're escaping from the, the house where the generals were. And, and uh, you, you can tell if you watch it that it's not really shot outdoors in a real forest, it's shot in a studio. Um, so those, those scenes were shot in Hollywood uh, in August. But they came back um, to Cottage Grove, they, ha they hadn't finished. Um, so on August 26th, a smaller group came back to Cottage Grove and they wrapped up, did the filming, and they took the, Buster Keaton himself, took the reels back to his mansion in Hollywood where he had a, a workshop behind his house where he, he actually literally handmade his own movies back then and he edited this film himself, put it all together, um, and it was done by the end of the year. So the general had its Oregon premiere at the Majestic Theater in Portland on December 31st, 1926. It had its Cottage Grove premiere a month later and its New York City premiere on February 5th. But 
the reviews were generally unenthusiastic. And it was really, it's really, it's, it was really a box office flop. It, it, and it cost about $750,000 to make, and it only took in about 500,000 at the box office. So it was, it wasn't financially successful. And, you know, people speculate, you know, why this is. I, I think that in 1927, people were just not, a lot of people were not ready for a Civil War comedy. It's the same reason those Tennessee people didn't want to have the movie made there. It was just, they couldn't quite, they weren't ready to wrap their head around the fact that there could be anything funny at all about the Civil War. And there, there is talk that some people actually walked out of the movie for that reason. So anyway, but three decades later, cinephiles rediscovered the general and it's now considered to be one of the greatest American movies ever made. And I, I recently um, got a book out of the library um, called 1,000 Movies to See Before You Die. <laughs> and sure enough, there it was, The General. And I just want to read you what it says about this, because this is, this is really something. This is what that book says about the general. It says, what makes the general so extraordinary is that it's superlative on every level. In terms of its humor, suspense, historical reconstruction, character study, visual beauty, and technical precision. One might even argue that it comes as close to flawless perfection as any feature ever made, comic or otherwise. Wow. <laughs> How's that for a, a send-off? Doesn't that make you want to watch the movie? <laughs> so anyway, yeah, I mean, that's the reputation that it has today as really, you know, one of the great, great American movies of all time. Um, and it's shown all over the world. I actually saw it um, once in uh, Madrid, Spain. I just happened to be there on vacation with my wife, and my son was there. And uh, we noticed that the general was playing in the film in a movie theater in Madrid, and so we we went to see. It. We we had a hard time just like sitting in our seats and not like raising our hand and say we're from Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> and Buster Keaton uh, considered the general to be his finest achievement. He said to an interviewer in 1963, three years before his death. I was more proud of that picture than any picture I ever made. And that's, you know, he was a real salt of the earth kind of plain spoken guy. So that, that's the way, uh, that was the way he talked. <clears throat> the film ranked 18th on the American Film Institute's list of the 100 greatest American films of all time, released in 2007. And, and you know who else is very proud of the general? Cottage Grove. <laughs> Cottage Grove is very proud of the general. If you go to Cottage Grove and you turn down the main street, you'll see the Bartell Hotel with a giant mural of Buster Keaton and the general. And they used to celebrate, for a while they celebrated something called Buster Keaton Days. I don't think they're, they've done that lately, but for a while they did that every, every year. And, um, you know, the centennial will come up in 2026, so I would imagine there'll be a huge uh, to do in Cottage Grove when we get to the centennial. And so it was the greatest thing to happen in Cottage Grove, Oregon, until three days in 1977. And does anybody know what happened then? Animal House, good. <laughs> if, you, if you remember Animal House, the very last scene, the homecoming parade, the very last scene was shot, Main Street, Cottage Grove. Three days they came back and they shot that. So, that, so that's another great uh, feather in their cap for Cottage Grove. And they're very proud of that too. Again and again, so. it's just, it's, it's amazing. One, one thing I, I should note, and then I'll take questions if you have any. Is that, um, is that Buster Keaton and Mary Mack did all their own stunts in that movie. And, and just the degree of difficulty 
for that, you know, with those locomotives, it's just, you know, it's just amazing. And they didn't get hurt, um, and that's kind of amazing too. So does anybody have any questions? This is Anne. When did this gem become a gem and not a failure? You know, probably not until like the 1950s or something like that. Wow. It was rediscovered, and it was, you know, redone, and... And uh, they wrote, you know, they had to write the music for it and all that sort of thing. So, yeah. Okay. But it just, I think it just gets more and more um, renowned. This is Barbara. First of all, I didn't realize how handsome Buster Keaton is. I've always thought of him as being kind of funny looking, but he's quite handsome. And I did love the movie, but am I the only one that was a little uncomfortable rooting for the South? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's really, I, that's really interesting to me that, um, but it, you know, it all goes back to the Andrews Raid book and, and so, um, but it, you know, it's interesting that, that, of course, these were all like Californians that made the movie, so they didn't have that fierce loyalty to the North or the South, I don't think. And so I, I think that's very interesting that the heroes are the Confederates. Uh, th <clears throat> this is Don. Um, I remember my mother telling that my grandmother would uh, take the horse and buggy to town and she would play the piano at the silent movies. And, and apparently the reason was to drown out the sound of the projector Yeah. F okay. for, for one thing. And I'm guessing that was 19... 18, uh -huh. early 20s, somewhere yeah. in there. So at some point, did they, uh, when did they, uh, like, start adding a soundtrack yeah, to it? Yeah, they did. And, yeah. um, and there's actually, if you buy this, you can buy this DVD if you really like it. You can watch it again. Um, and I think it has three different soundtracks on the DVD. You can pick, you can pick the one you like best. So I, I love this one. And, I, you know, I actually can't watch it without this one. I just love this music. Uh, yeah, my name is uh, David. Uh, a serious movie was made about a bunch of Northerners who went down south, disguised as Southerners, and stole a Southern train and were taking it north. I think they were all caught and several of them were executed. Okay, good. I didn't know that. You. Mr. This is Harvey. Yeah, Harvey. Uh, when I lived in Petersburg, Virginia area, uh, I read of a story that of a train, a Civil War train, that went off a bridge or somehow went into a river in that area. I think it was the, uh, the Appomattox River. Do you know if there's any connection between between that story and the the reason? Uh, he made the movie. I really don't, but I, you know what? I'm going to try to find out. That's really interesting. Yes, sir. This is Ken. When you saw it in Madrid, was were the captions in Spanish? Yes, and and the and the house was full of people, and they thoroughly enjoyed it. I mean, it, it's the kind of movie you know that you can show all over the world, and people love it. It's just so terrific. Yes, ma'am. My name is Jenks. Um, I had heard at one point that the early exodus of a lot of the Jewish musicians out of Germany who ended up in Hollywood in the early 30s, that they were the ones who really pushed the music to go with the films into the next generation of providing the, uh, the background and not just to cover up noise. Okay. I think that was part of it. Great. Very interesting. Oh, Paul here. What I was impressed with was the quality of the picture itself. They must have been have spent a lot of time uh, re restoring that because I've seen some other silence that aren't nearly as clear as that. That was almost like new. Right. I think they've done that. And could you could you tell the scenes that were shot in Hollywood and the ones that were shot on location? Maybe maybe you have to watch it thirty times like <laughs> like I have. But yeah. It's kind of, it's pretty interesting to, to see that. Sometimes you'll look and you'll see that the background is not real. You know, it's obviously like a set and there's like trees and mountains, but we, they don't look real, so. 
but it's pretty interesting. Yes, ma'am. Um, Sally Shriver. Um, maybe I misunderstood what you said, but I thought they only had one train that looked like the one that we saw. Well, they, you know, the, How did they duplicate? the general itself is, you know, they say was very similar to the real general in Chattanooga, but all three trains were very, were very similar. And they, you know, they had to, to find all those trains and bring them all to Cottage Grove to do that movie. And it's amazing. And, and, and Marion Mack and Buster Keaton became quite good train engineers, if you don't know this. I mean, it's amazing. They're going backwards and forwards and up and down and, ah. Uh, just incredible. Hi, I'm Deborah. The only thing I want to know is who was Buster Keaton's fitness trainer? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was. Yeah, he was only 25 years old. You know, when awesome. when he made that movie. So he's a very young Amazing. man. Amazing. And this was, you know, after this, his career sort of went on the downside. The fact that this movie lost a lot of money meant that he really lost his whole. Um, studio that he was running himself and he had to go to work I think for MGM and um, and you know it was because of the financial thing he you know his reputation was he'd spend any amount of money he could get his hands on to make a great movie and you really saw it in this movie but the ones that that come af after this you know you'll see that the budget is quite smaller and he kind of goes back after this one just to straight um, comedy, slapstick, all that sort of thing. So this is a real, a real unusual um, picture in his career. Yes. Hi, the name is Franca. Um, the question I had is that uh, I was interested to see they uh, used African American actors in the very beginning. So were they local people, or were they? I think. In well, Hollywood? they hired the Oregon National Guard, and they they actually came down from Eugene and points north so those were national guard members and i think at the very you know at the very end when they're all coming out of their tents i swear there's like an african american confederate soldier so so that's kind of that's kind of interesting to see and then you know in the opening scenes you see african americans too but i i bet you any money they were in the national guard hi this is tim uh, the one false note I saw in that film was, and I laughed at it, maybe it was meant to be funny, it was the lightning bolt. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. How about the bear? I'm sure he was like chained, chained up. Hi, this is Gwendolyn, and I was very impressed with the music editing and the precision of it and the sound effects. And is that something that Buster Keaton did also or did he have? No, this, this soundtrack I think was made in um, England actually. Oh. And I think, you know, they, oh, did, it was a added great, they did a great job yeah. to Thank really you. coordinate. That's why I love it. So I, I just think it really fits the film so well. It's amazing. Anything else? We're, we're just about out of oh, time. I have one question. Oh. This is Ken. Did oh. you ever give this talk in Cottage Grove? No, I've never given it. I've never been invited to Cottage Grove. Maybe, maybe if I live long enough, I can go to the Centennial. But they, but they know, they know a lot. Of, they know more than I do. I actually went down there to do research. I went to the, um, to the historical society there and did a lot of research. And I, you know, I drove up the Roe River. There's no, the train tracks are gone, and they've been replaced by a f fabulous bike trail um so that's that's what and you but you there's a road and you can you can go up and see where they made the movie and people have actually gone back and figured out like where the bridge was and that sort of thing so that's a lot of fun well jim i think we're out of time we're out of time thank you for thanks uh, again sharing a wonderful film with you.